Hi, this is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor from the Salt Lake City VA and the University of Utah. By now, you've all heard that Dr. Martin A. Samuels, the founding chair of the neurology department at Brigham and Women's in Boston, passed away this past week. Marty was known for so many accomplishments, including his leadership in the field of neurocardiology and his humanistic approach to patients and to life as a whole, and his advocacy for supporting the pivotal role of a teacher educator in neurology. I didn't know Marty personally, but I was certainly part of the entire generation of neurologists who attended his legendary talks and lectures at the big meetings. They were always so much fun. He ran them with his humorous, down-to-earth style of teaching and would emphasize the importance of comprehensive history taking. There was always a theme of considering the entire patient and usually a laser focus in at least a couple of the cases that he would use as teaching tools on the critical importance of maintaining a strong knowledge base of internal medicine. When I heard of his passing, I found myself wanting to hear his voice. And so I went back to the Neurology Podcast archives. You you can do the same, actually. You just search by his name in your podcast app library. And I found this absolute gem of a podcast. It's from a decade ago, September 2013, when Farrah Mateen interviewed Marty for our Living Legends series. The interview was recorded in front of an audience at the AAN annual meeting in San Diego that year. And so there's a lot of background noise, but I think you'll agree for this interview, it just makes it even more authentic. So I hope you'll enjoy hearing these stories and clinical pearls that Marty has left with us. My name is Farrah Mateen. I'm from the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins University. And today I'll be interviewing Dr. Martin Samuels, who is the Chief of Neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School as part of our Living Legend interviews for the Neurology Podcast. Hello, Dr. Samuels. Nice to see you. Thanks for uh, including me. Our pleasure. Thank you for speaking with us today. So the first question for you, um, of all of your projects, studies, and papers you've been involved in, uh, which was the most exciting to you? It's a very uh, interesting question to think back over one's whole career and decide what's the most exciting thing. I would say the first, the very first major project was the most exciting, and it came out of, it was totally chance, as most of these things are, right? So I was a neurology resident, and I had the opportunity to um, drop out for a year and go back to Boston City Hospital, where I was a medical resident and be the chief resident for a year in medicine. And so I did it. I took the year off, went back to be a chief medical resident. And during that year, the chief of the service uh, introduced us to a publisher at the Little Brown Publishing Company, which was a company that still exists, but it did medical books in those days in Boston. And he uh, told us that he wanted us, uh, that is the chief residents, to accomplish something during the year, not to just adjust the uh, slide projector. But our job was actually to uh, accomplish something. So he... Uh, uh, gave us a project, which was to uh, write up the emergency management of various common diseases at the Boston City Hospital. So we did that, and at the end of the year, I realized that there wasn't a book on therapy of neurological conditions. You'll probably remember something called the Washington Manual, which was a uh, little spiral-bound book that every house officer carried. It was for general medicine. There wasn't anything for neurology. So I told the editor that I thought we should have a manual of neurologic therapeutics. And there was a sort of a chuckle after I said this. And he said, neurologic therapeutics, that sounds like an oxymoron, you know, to me. <laughs> sort of like airline food or something of this kind. And I said, no, no, there's, there's really therapeutics in neurology. This is in 1972, 1973. I said, oh, we have headache and we've got certain infections that we can treat. And so we wrote, uh, we, my, by that I mean our group of residents, uh, actually wrote a manual of neurologic therapeutics. That thing is in its, I don't know, eighth or ninth or tenth edition now. And it was the beginning of an era in neurology that, of course, I didn't see coming, but the neurology has become now one of the most therapeutically intense of all the fields. So all the old joke about neurologists being unable to treat anything is really not true. And I was lucky enough to sort of be there right at the beginning, the first uh, manual of neurologic therapeutics. And it's not a, not an oxymoron anymore. Most people don't laugh when they hear it. Well, I own a copy, so uh, <laughs> appreciate your contribution. I'd like to ask you about uh, how neurology has evolved over the decades and uh, what has been most surprising to you. 
Well, I think uh, to me the most surprising thing is the separation of neurological medicine from the rest of medicine. That's been good in many ways, and in fact, in my own hospital, in my own department, I made a big effort to do that, to try to get neurology into departmental status and away from the Department of Medicine. Not because I didn't like that, the Department of Medicine, but because I didn't think they could represent us well in the hospital and in the community. But this has actually had a very negative um, side to it, and that is uh, neurology really is so separate now from medicine that almost nobody who goes into our field has trained in medicine. Uh, most people have a, a year, a preliminary year. They don't do much internal medicine, and they don't know much internal medicine. So at this course now, at this uh, meeting, the American Academy of Neurology, we have a couple of courses on neurology and internal medicine, and it's really become a tiny little niche of neurology. <laughs> neurology uh, has become multiple sclerosis and stroke and uh, neuro-oncology and movement disorders. Those are the core of neurology, and the sort of the mother and father of neurology, internal medicine, have been uh, alienated from the core of neurology. So uh, I find that surprising, I th and I think it's a shame that that's happened. I wish we could have both our autonomy, which I think we need politically, and our parents, which is medicine, which I, I think is our closest relative in medicine. So I guess if those are the parents, the sort of stepsister might be psychiatry, and I'm curious what you think of the sort of separation of one organ into two specialties. Does that surprise you? Yeah, well, it's actually more than two specialties, isn't it? Because if you think about it, we've got neurologists, psychiatrists, a certain amount of endocrinology. We've got sleep specialists. We have pain specialists. All those are branches of neurology, actually, right? So it, there are many, many other fields that have been broken off from the core of uh, neurological medicine. And the pendulum has definitely come back with regard to psychiatry and neurology. So at once they were one. My mentor, my original mentor in neurology was a neuropsychiatrist. And then, it, then they split apart, quite far apart. And now they're coming back together. And when I recently did a recruit for the new chief of psychiatry at the Brigham, we recruited a, uh, a modern neuropsychiatrist, a guy, who, uh, a guy named David Silberswag, who actually is a neurologist and a psychiatrist, but with sort of a new take on it. He's an imager. He's interested in the imaging and the physiology of psychiatric symptoms. So it has come back together in a way. I think uh, all of these other fields need to be brought back into our tent, pain and sleep and many, many others that have, been, that have sort of slipped out into other parts of medicine. Thank you. This is a question I wanted to ask you for some time. Uh, who is your most interesting patient? And we know you see many interesting patients, but who would take who the case? Who was my most interesting patient? was the last one I saw, I think, is the most interesting patient. I can remember that the, the most clearly, right? <laughs> this is uh, called the availability heuristic, the one that I can remember. No, I do have a memorable, a remarkable patient. I actually presented him his case just a few minutes ago in one of my talks. And I can tell you about him because he has given me permission to talk about him, although I'm not going to use his name. Uh, he's an anesthesiologist. He was a professor of anesthesiology, an extremely accomplished person who uh, began to have difficulty using his hands and was misdiagnosed as having carpal tunnel syndrome and then misdiagnosed as having cervical spondylosis. Had a couple of operations in his own hospital with anesthesia given by his own anesthesiology faculty. He was the chair. They gave the anesthesia, and he was made horribly worse by this uh, anesthetic and ended up in a state where he was really demented, unable to function, severely depressed, so that over a period of maybe three months, this guy went from the professor and chair of this department to a totally helpless person. And it, uh, so ironic because it turned out that uh, he had pernicious anemia and he was exposed to nitrous oxide, which we know blocks that enzyme, methyltransferase, so the irony was, here was a guy who wasn't recognized to have one of the oldest and most important diseases in neurological medicine, pernicious anemia. It wasn't recognized, even though he was being seen in the hospital where the disease was cured and where the Nobel Prize was given. It wasn't recognized. And his own colleagues gave him nitrous oxide and almost killed him. <laughs> and they did it twice. And so uh, he's a remarkable person. He's, he's been willing to sort of come out. We had a phenomenal grand rounds just less than a year ago on the medical service where I presented his case, and then I introduced him, and as a surprise, he came walking down the amphitheater, and there he was to tell us what it felt like to lose your mind, essentially. Lose your mind and lose your ability to work, 
and have nobody be able to recognize what it is, and then for it to suddenly turn around and to have everything return to you. It was really, really memorable. And I have movies of him and movies of the original Cure of the B-12. I put them all together in, in one session. And so I would say that he is my most memorable single patient from my whole whole career, and he is my, he's my friend and my colleague, and thank goodness he's all right. Another treatable neurological illness. Yes, indeed. The question uh, up next is, what do you anticipate that neurology will be in the future, and uh, what excites you most about neurology for the future? Yeah, well, you know Yogi Berra's famous comment about the future. He said, it's hard to predict, except especially about the future, which I think is true. I would say that my own predictions about the way neurological medicine was going to go up to now have been pretty poor. I don't think that I would have predicted that neurology would have devolved or differentiated itself into all of these fields. I think in the 21st century, uh, neurology is the internal medicine of the 21st century. If you look back at medicine, out of which we grew, at least I grew, into a neurologist, there was once, uh, not that long ago, let's say uh, 1950, 1940, there was some, something called an internist, and that internist was a specialist. That, that's really the idea behind the American College of Physicians. These were specialists. They would see the patients who the family doctors didn't understand, and they would take care of the internal organs. They took care of renal failure and heart failure and liver failure. And then what we saw happen in between 1950 and the end of the 20th century was the dissolution of the internist into all these specialties, so that I think now... If you can't imagine a, uh, a hematologist taking care of your thyroid disease. This is an incomprehensible idea, and yet that's the way it was in 1940 or 1950. And what I think we're experiencing in neurology is an exact replay of the same thing, so that it's becoming unimaginable to imagine that a sleep specialist can go on the service and take care of stroke patients, or that a cancer neurologist can do multiple sclerosis. So I think it's very much analogous. And now in our department, we have 14 divisions. I think they're, the maximum number you could have maybe is 20 divisions, each of these with their own boards and their own fellows. What's going to be left of general neurology? What, what does that mean? Is it going to be like internal medicine, which tried to, they tried to reestablish something called internal medicine. They created hospitalism and modern uh, uh, internal medicine, it hasn't really worked that well, right? There isn't the internist of the past. There's just the so-called PCP. Um, so I, I hope that we in neurology, although we are replaying history, and I think it's hard to avoid that, that we won't lose the... People come to me and want advice. They say, should I follow your course? The answer to that is no, you should not follow my course because, you know, what's the chance of a general neurologist like me, not only becoming a professor at a major medical center, a major medical school, which is a very research-intensive medical school, but to be the chair of a department of neurology. What, what's the chance of that happening? And the only reason that happened was chance. There was a, a series of breaks, luck, which put me in a position where it actually made it easy for the people around me to allow me to develop more and more responsibility. And then by the time it happened, it was sort of too late, and they couldn't do anything about it. I was, I was sort of in there. And uh, I've been you know, the chair of neurology at the Brigham now since 1988. That's a quarter of a century. And uh, would they do that again? I mean, I've been on a lot of search committees recently for the chief of neurosurgery, for the chief of psychiatry. And uh, would, would that happen again? I would say it's pretty unlikely. Although I will say, as, a, as one caveat, they just chose a new chief of medicine at the Mass General Hospital, which is our sister hospital across town, and they chose a general internist. How about that? I, mean, I, think they, I think that was considered an enormous surprise when that was done. So if we are always following in the footsteps of internal medicine, maybe that day will come back. But at this moment, that's not the standard route to department chairmanship. Fair enough. Uh, next to last question, what advice do you have for our younger listeners 
who are beginning their careers, uh, either pursuing academics or private practice? Well, don't do what I did. <laughs> That's my <laughs> biggest advice. I wouldn't do it that way. Um, no, I'll tell you exactly what I tell most people. I mean, obviously, some people have the, have an idea in advance, and I, it isn't my job description to talk people out of things. So I think if somebody comes to me and they say, you know, I have an MD, PhD, I'm very interested in a particular bit of science. I want to do that science 80% of my time. I want to spend a little of my time uh, working in a clinical neurology department. I encourage them. I think if that's what they want to do, they should do it. But if they are tabula rasa and they don't have a clear idea, what I advise people to do is to not do what everybody else is doing. I think that is the key to uh, having a career which is meaningful. So at the moment, if you look about what is everybody doing, well, everybody is taking a stroke fellowship, they're taking a neurointensivism fellowship and learning how to put in catheters and blow up balloons, they're taking movement disorder fellowships, they're doing cognitive and behavioral neurology and are interested in dementia, um, they're interested in epilepsy, they want to be epileptologists. My advice to people is pick something that nobody else has ever heard of. And uh, that's what I did. I became a neurocardiologist. You say, well, a neurocardiologist, what's that? Well, it doesn't exist. There's nobody else on earth. There is no other <laughs> neurocardiologist. Now, the truth is there are a few other people now, mostly cardiologists and a few neurologists who have become interested in it. But what I've encouraged people to do is to uh, go and take a fellowship in infectious diseases. Don't be an amateur. Go and work with the ID people. And don't be special. I don't want to be a special member of the group. I'm going to be an ID person for the next two years. I'm going to do exactly what they do. And when I'm finished, I'm going to be a serious neuro-ID person. Not a person who read about it in the books, but the real thing. Recently, we've had a few people do this in rheumatology. I think rheumatology is a very close sister to neurology. Chronic diseases, highly cognitive, very similar. Um, so a number of people we've trained have gone and done rheumatology fellowships with rheumatologists and learned about real immunology and learned how to really examine the joints. And what does a positive ANA really mean to a rheumatologist, not what some neurologist says about it? And if you think about this, you can do this in every field of internal medicine and some other ones as well. So my advice now is if you want to become a neuroendocrinologist, good idea. Go train with the endocrinologist. Learn what they know before you call yourself a neuroendocrinologist. And I think this is true of neuro-oncology. I think the future of cancer neurology is going to be understand cancer, not just call yourself a neurologist who knows about brain tumors, but understand cancer and understand rheumatology and ID and hematology. That, I think, is the future. I think we've got all of those fields that are essentially wide open. And most of them will accept neurologists with open arms. It's, just, it's amazing. I went up to one of our electrophysiologists, cardiologists, the other day, and I said there was a neurologist interested. He said, send them over. I'll teach them how to do electrophysiology testing. And then that person will really know about cardiology from the inside out. Uh, so my view is don't be a uh, dilettante. Don't think you can pick it up. These fields are serious. Get in there and do it yourself. It's worth the time. So that's my advice to people. Thank you. And uh, did you always know you're going to be a neurologist? Always know. Let me when think. did it become apparent? I don't know. I think back in why I'm a doctor to begin with. And uh, the reason I'm a doctor is because <laughs> when my doctor would come to my house, he made house calls. His name was Dr. J.W. Epstein. He was an immigrant from Vienna, Jewish immigrant. He was a pediatrician in Cleveland, and he made uh, house calls. Came up in his jalopy in the front of your house. So if you got a fever and, uh, and sick, my mother would call. And when that, when that doctor would come, it was as if a priest or the pope or the president had come to visit. <laughs> I mean, everybody changed their underwear. Everybody cleaned up. And when that he pulled up to the house, they said, you know, the doctor is here. And, uh, I mean, really, uh, the doctor was worshipped, not for his money. He didn't have money. He drove a jalopy. He was a pediatrician. For his knowledge and for his uh, humanity, Right. And when that guy came to see me, I remember he would examine me in front of my mother. My mother would be worried. My father was worried, too, but he wasn't supposed to show that he was worried. <laughs> my, my mother would be worried. Was it polio? That's what they were worried about, with polio. And he would come and examine me, 
and be tapping on my back, you know, percussing my back. And as he was percussing my back, he would be saying out loud in his Viennese accent, sounds good, sounds normal, everything looks fine. And my mother, you could see the worry come off of my mother's face. And I thought, wow, this guy is powerful. He is a powerful figure. Look what he can do. And uh, I saw him as a patient until I was about 15. And already his office was filled with nothing but little kids. And here I am, a 15-year-old. <laughs> I went in his office and I said, Dr. Epstein, uh, how long can I see you as a patient? He says, I'm going to see you until you're a doctor. That's what he said. And it was literally, I said, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor for sure. And that's the reason. The neurology part, I think, came to me in medical school because of a mentor, a guy named Charles Ehring, who I met. And after one half day in clinic with that one man, I said, I'm going to be a neurologist. It's pretty much the same thing. And he's the one who said to me, I said, how should I train Dr. Ehring in neurology? He said that before you're a neurologist, we got to make you into a doctor. And I want you to go to Boston City Hospital. That's where he had trained. And I want you to learn to be a doctor. And once you've learned to be a doctor, then we'll teach you how to be a neurologist. Wonderful. And so uh, we're in San Diego, obviously, with a great audience. And do you have any uh, recollections of AAN? I imagine you've been coming for several years. Yeah, I remember being here many, many times. In fact, my, my wife and I went to a restaurant last night that we've been going to for probably 30 years every time we come to San Diego. And uh, no, the AEN uh, is, is a lot of fun, and I've enjoyed coming for all these years. It's mainly social for me now. You know, I, I enjoy seeing all my friends. Tomorrow night, we're going to have our annual reunion. Of sure. Everybody who's ever passed through our program. And um, people take pictures in their groups. They go out to dinner. Mm -hmm. It's like a college reunion, and I think that's the wonderful thing about it. I mean, neurology is really a pretty small community. And uh, one of the things I can do for people is that when they come for advice and they say, you know, my family lives in Houston. I was just talking to one of my former residents who is in Houston now doing extremely well. And he said, I want to go to Houston for the following personal reasons. I said, it's okay. I'm going to call my friends. And I can just call up my friends and say, you know, I've got a guy. And um, that was done for me. And that's what I do for them. And uh, so to me, that's the really important part of the academy is the fact that we can all get together and share our common experiences. And um, it's a nice field, neurology, because we don't make so much money that people go into our field to make money. And we don't make so little money that people avoid our field because they can't make any money. <laughs> We're perfect. <laughs> to keep it We're way. right in the middle. So I think the people who want to be neurologists want to be neurologists because they're cut out for it. And that's like 1% or 2% of medical students. Right? Not many people are cut out for it. But if you're cut out for it, it's the best. It's, it's the greatest. I would never, never trade it for anything else. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Samuels, for your insights into the field, for telling us when you change your underwear and uh, <laughs> all of the other details. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone who is listening today, and uh, we appreciate and generally your contributions to Sarah, neurology. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Bye.